right. So thank you for those of you who have joined us today. Um, I'm realizing now that I didn't put the number after the part on the presentation, but this is actually part six of this school year's community collaboration with the John Croslin School. And um, I was just telling her this morning, or I guess it's afternoon now, this is Elisa's second presentation with us this school year doing one of our collab community collabs and so appreciative of what she has to offer every time she does speak with us and share um, her input on topics. And today she is covering a very hot topic, social emotional development. Um, so with that being said, I will stop sharing and let you take it from here. Awesome. All right. As you guys may have been listening, it seems like my um, PowerPoint will cover the whole screen. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to just put it in the chat box and Carrie can take a look. And I also can't see you guys. Um, so, yep, my name is Elise Bone and I work at Dandelion Family Counseling um, today. Um, social emotional development was requested. So um, as I was creating this PowerPoint, as I do with any presentation, um, I try really hard to think about what the parent may have in mind, um, knowing just with my extensive like knowledge, I could talk for hours and hours and especially um, um, because I'm also a professor, so I teach and I'm sometimes like trying to separate the two between like teaching students or talking to parents. Um, so I did my best in trying to condense this topic. Um, there's so many um, components to social emotional development with the different theories that they have developed over the years and kind of information that has come up today. So um, what I'll typically say in any presentation that I really want you guys to interact. So if you have a question or if you have any thoughts about something that I'm saying, um, please feel free to ask the question during the time that I'm talking about it because it may make it easier for me to answer based on what you're asking about. Um, so I am going to talk, but I love interaction. I know some people may not want to interact. Um, just uh, feel free to ask a question. It may not have to be about like your kiddo, but just like clarifying on the information. Um, and I'll often say like, hey, do you understand this? Are there any, any feedback about this thing that I've covered just to make sure that that's clear? All righty. So like I said, social emotional development is a big caveat, like a big category, um, but social development, how I would define it is the quality of a person's social experiences based on their past relationship in that person's life. Um, whereas emotional development is described as the growth of a feeling or effect that experiences um, like physiologically, behaviorally, or consciously. So that person may feel in their body or they may act out a behavior or they may experience that like mentally. So I put consciously. So putting those two things together, um, I would say that it refers to the process in which children learn um, or a person learns, they understand and express their emotion in their early years. So when you're talking about the concept of social emotional development, it's often talked about in early years. Usually you're not going to talk a lot about that after a person reaches like teenage or early 20 years because they should have reached milestones. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about more today is not about infancy because it starts off at birth once children are born um, the process starts right away so i'm not going to focus so much on that but um i'm going to talk about a theory that's often used with um, psychosocial um development and then i'm not going to talk too much about after the age of 18 too so just kind of staying in the age of like elementary to about 18 um, years old so some foundations of social emotional development are the self. So self-awareness, self-regulation, social emotional understanding, empathy and caring, um, initiative and learning. And then you'll have like the social interaction. So that interaction includes like the familiar adults and that could be an infant or a toddler, um, developing interactions with peers, participating in a team like structure. So group participation, being able to cooperate and understand responsibility and actually act on that responsibility. 
And then you have the relationship. So attachment to the parents, um, close relationships with teachers and caregivers and friendships. So these are the foundations of what a person will experience in their development of social emotional abilities and having a solid foundation in those social emotional abilities. So as I was describing, um, there's a theory that I often run to when I'm thinking of like social development and that's Eric Erickson. Um, he is like the father of psychosocial stages of children and a lot of the information and research and even um, the National Institutes of Health and how they develop like state curriculums are a lot based on um, partially some of his findings. So I'm just gonna go through the through those um, and he theorized that there were like, once you complete a stage of the psychosocial development, then you move on to the next stage. So there's some controversy with this for people that don't believe, um, some theorists that don't believe that everything is um, what we call critical period. So after you hit one period, then you move on to the next period. Some people use the theory of like continuity, which means that you're always learning, you're always growing, and you don't have to hit a period to meet re a mile, reach a milestone. So I pretty much agree with both of the concepts being put together. However, um, a lot of the ideologies are based off of some of these um, people's theories in the beginning. Um, so that's why this one's pretty important to me. But um, kids can definitely reach some of these milestones without hitting that critical period. They just may experience some negative emotions or characteristics when not hitting that period um, in their life. So trust versus mistrust is the first one. Um, birth to one years old. So children, the child develops a sense of the world that is safe and reliable. And when they're able to develop this sense, then they develop that secure attachment. If they're not able to develop this sense, then they have the other types of attachments that are ambivalent, disorganized, and avoidant. Um, and I'm going to talk about attachment after we talk about the psychosocial um, developmental stages, because the attachment style can sometimes focus more on um, the emotional part, but they're pretty much co coincide together. So the trust versus mistrust is exactly what it says. The child either learns to trust the world or they mistrust the world and how they start to feel safe with that caregiver or parent, whoever is the primary caregiver of that person. And then Erickson says, like, once you hit this point, then you develop, um, you're going to the stage of autonomy versus shame. And I just want to touch on, before I go into that, the attachment styles. Attachment styles don't just stop at one years old, they continue. Um, I work with lots of children that were still working on attachment styles. So just if you miss that mark, it doesn't mean it can never be changed. It just means that you may start to have some of these experiences after not having that secure development. But that's an okay thing because that those are things that can always be worked on. Um, people even work on their attachment styles um, in adulthood. So from the age one to three, um, a child develops a sense of independence to use new mental and motor controls. Um, and the theorist Piaget would talk about the cognitive abilities in this phase. So being able to learn new things based on the knowledge that they've learned from like um, their parents or daycare and they're building on this knowledge and feeling confident in their abilities to under start to understand the world. Um, they develop this sense of curiosity, being able to move and touch things and hold things and drop things and make mistakes. Uh, so in this stage, they are self-sufficient. They're able to eat, toilet train, and talk. This person that um, accomplishes this stage, or Erickson say, would say successfully accomplishes this stage, have a, has an increase of confidence and independence, while somebody that may struggle um, at this stage may be feeling criticized overly, um, and they're constantly doubting themselves, like feeling that they can't explore the world, they can't be curious, um, that something that they may touch hurts, hurts them or they don't understand the world very well yet. So that's that doubting um, and feeling like there's something going on with me and there's something wrong with me early. And then you go into initi um, initiative versus guilt. And this is from three to six year old, three to six year old. Um, they can take control over their environment. They can develop interpersonal skills. 
Um, this child can also learn to explore, they can imagine, they can feel remorse for their actions, and their skills are broadened throughout the act of play, um, cooperating with others while also leading and learning how to follow, like learning not to have to be in, um, in charge all the time. So this stage of success would be having a sense of purpose, um, feeling like, yes, I have purpose to be curious, be a friend, learn new things. So I've moved um, past just being curious in the world, but like I have a sense of purpose. I have a sense of like, I'm supposed to be doing something. I'm learning responsibility, things like that. Um, and I'm understanding people, I'm understanding my peers. I can use my imagination. Um, what can happen if there's a disruption is there's a lack of purpose, um, depending highly on adults and their imagination is restricted and that imagination is restricted goes a lot to the point of like, I don't feel like I can use my curiosity. Like I'm not really sure of how to interact with other people, um, because I can learn with, with my peers on how to imagine when I'm not feeling successful in that area, it can kind of restrict that imagination. Um, and the depending on adults has a lot to do with um, not feeling like they can explore and they can't learn on their own. So if I make a mistake, then I don't know how to fix it or I don't know how to sit in front of something and try to manipulate and try to figure it out. I'm going to highly depend on the adult to do everything for me because that I don't feel confident. The one before, we didn't meet that stage. I, I may not feel confident to be able to explore and try new things and build off of um, the problem solving, like one step to the next step. And then they can feel that can lead to a sense of feeling a bit guilty. Then there's the industry versus inferiority. So this is probably like elementary school kiddos um, on the higher end. So the industry really refers to the idea of learning or school. Um, this theory was created like back in the early 1900s. So I'm thinking of like industry, like working. Um, so when they're thinking of that, your um, what's your occupation? So for kids, it's like reading and writing. Um, they learn to create self-discipline. They're able to relate to their peers and follow the rules. So learning that, hey, there's this social structure of rules that we're supposed to follow. Or when I'm playing a game, this person makes up rules and I'm choosing to follow their rules or we compromise to make rules together. They start to learn some of those nuances within the relationship socially. Um, but one of but in addition to that is really feeling confident in the academic environment um, about their ability to problem solve, be curious, learn, not know something, but try again and learn to, on top of the skills that they already have so that they can be successful in the academic area. So success is taking prides in their accomplishments. And this can is mostly related to academics, but it can be related to all aspects of life, especially extracurricular activity. They develop a strong sense of trust in themselves. So like I feel good about the things that I've done and I've learned, even if I've made mistakes, even if I didn't know how to do it at first. Um, the disruption can be the lack of pride that leads to feeling incompetent or doubting the future. So lots of anxiety could come up here um, simply because I don't know how to trust myself to rely on making a mistake or I don't know how to move forward when something is really hard um, and I don't know how to do it right away. But knowing that um, maybe I'm just gonna lean to an adult to do something or I'm going to just avoid it altogether because I don't feel like I can do it. So that's where a lot of avoidance can come in too. And the last one I'm gonna talk about, as I mentioned, this goes all the way into late adulthood. So stopping here, there's identity versus role confusion. And he, when we look at this theory, it is actually pretty minimal. Um, there's a lot of other theories that talk about like identity um, development and then gender development. So that kind of goes in this same area, but he was focused more on just the social aspect of this. So um, 12 to 18, there's this development of personal identity, sense of self, um, roles, which means the roles of the world and who does what, mom and dad. Um, this is where gender roles also comes in, like 
male, male and females, like knowing these roles, the attitudes, the identities, the expectations of different age groups too, like as a 12 to 18 year old, like what am I supposed to be doing? Or what do I notice like little kids doing? Or what do I notice adults doing? Um, what do I notice like being a brother does or like a student? So you're starting to notice all roles in life, um, but gender roles definitely falls in there. And this is where that would start to happen. And then the success looks like a strong sense of self. Like I am identifying with what I like, what I don't like, um, maybe some strengths, weaknesses, what role I play in a friendship or at school, um, what's my attitude towards different things, um, other people's roles. So I just don't know my role. I understand other people's roles to a certain extent. It's not that deep, but it's pretty surface level. Um, and what they start to learn, like what do they want to accomplish? And that kind of goes into what do I like and what do I want to do with that like? Um, what do I enjoy and how I, how am I going to build on that? Um, and then that could, at the later years of this time frame, that can lead into like what I want to do with my life and how am I going to get there? So those like 16, 17, 18 year olds, um, the 12 year olds can think about that, but it's not going to be as prominent as a leader um, on the later um, latter end of this age range. So disruption can look like confused about who they are and, and their place in society and what they're supposed to be doing, um, what they like, what they don't like, like they haven't really in tune with their self, feel confident about what their strengths are and what they can do well with that. So there's a sense of confusion um, and that can also lead to feeling um, a bit hopeless and helpless and possibly lead to some depressive symptoms. Doesn't mean it is depression, but it could lead to some depressive symptoms. Um, and then there is, like I said, the identity development kind of goes into like the different areas of where you start off with. Um, this, is that really important? And then, and I think this is by Maria. I I forget the, the name of the theory, but it starts off with like, if there's a crisis or um, if there's a sense of, um, I want to be able to learn more about myself or I don't want to be learn, able to learn more about myself and what I want to do and who I am. Um, another part of the stage is, hey, is this identity something that my parents have created? Like, I'm not worried about my identity because it's been conditioned and instilled into me. So I'm just relying on somebody else. I'm not going to really look into myself. Um, that's identity foreclosure. And then the um, another area is when somebody has um, they want to work on getting to know themselves and having that self-esteem and developing confidence, but really unsure of where to start. And the last one is identity achievement when they have worked through all these processes and feel confident and they can move forward. So some people can start on either stage. They're not in order, um, but they're just different um, different stages that have been researched with this age and could be even later on in life too that are often pretty common. So that's all that can get into a whole nother area because it can go into the gender um, roles and identity as well. So this is a, just a nice clear cut chart of the Erickson stages of psychosocial development. And it, like I said, it goes all the way to late adulthood. And what you're looking at as the different areas, like I said, like one's success and one's like despair, or they, they use the word despair or disruptive, either one. Um, but good, bad is kind of how it goes, because if we don't meet this area, this is what you could experience. And it's a theory, so it doesn't mean that everybody is going to experience that, but it's a possibility. Um, and if you don't hit some of these milestones, uh, it may be harder for you in that period, but by no means does it mean that you can't meet the milestone, and by no means does it mean that, like, oh, you've missed it, you know, and we can't work on it. You can definitely still work on it, but given the nature of like the, the social developmental stages of humans and how they go, this person may start to feel this way because that they're in this area of life where this is prominent. And if they're not meeting that, um, they may notice their peers are, and then that's where it maybe get a little bit tricky and a little bit harder. All right. And this is the end of me explaining the actual development process of Erickson. So if there's any thoughts or anything about that, 
welcome for anybody to share any feedback, concerns. Okay, I will keep going. So some beliefs about hitting those milestones are um, these mental thought process that kids may create. So if they achieve these developmental stage, stages, children can develop various beliefs about themselves and others. And within these beliefs, it, one of them can be that they learn that they're lovable, they deserve care and attention about themselves. Another one can be um, they learn that others can be responsive to their needs and others are trustworthy. And that kind of falls into like attachment too. And that's what we'll lead into. But these are two mental processes that they can start to develop once they've hit some of these um, social areas. And some of the outcomes based on Erickson, um, hitting those milestones for, I would say up to the age of 18, are academic success, success, like I mentioned in the inferiority stage, likability among peers. This is not negative. They, they actually use the word popular or popularity, which I don't like, because I think that nowadays it's often viewed as very negative. So likability among peers just means that it seems like that person is healthy and they're able to establish a connection. So it's not like, oh, you're better than or you're super popular because you act like this, but it's likability that somebody's gonna want to create a connection or a relationship with you. Um, next, ability to manage negative emotions. So when you're engaging with peers, you actually learn more about negative emotions, why people feel the other a certain way and you learn that negative emotions are okay and they can be managed and they don't have to be bad. So you learn that in a social setting, which is really cool. When you don't hit some of those milestones, you have a harder time managing some of those negative emotions. Engage in socially appropriate behaviors. Because you're viewing other people and aware of other people, you start to learn about what's appropriate and what may not be appropriate because you're being attuned to that person's needs you're being aware and conscious and you know about yourself. Like in the beginning, we said the foundation. So you have like self, when you are able to learn a, a, a decent amount about yourself, you get to learn more about other people, you intertwine those things and then you start to have that um, outcome of relationship and connection. And last one is basically what I said. So develop healthy relationships with peers. So here's some characteristics of the healthy relationships. So attunement, excuse me, this word pretty much means that a person is able to be aware, understand, um, in the presence of another person, uh, what their needs are. Like I'm aware, I'm conscious, I sense you. Um, another person's being like uh, nonverbals, verbals, just like, how their body is responding. They're, it's, the word I like to use is just aware, but you're attuned to that other person. So when you're able to have that characteristic, it's so important in a relationship. Um, relatedness, so relatedness is a psychological need to be able to establish that close emotional connections and attachment with other people where you can relate with who they are, you can relate with the emotion. Um, I would even think of this as like perspective taking in a sense. Um, they use the word relatedness, but it um, could be defined more in like perspective taking on, of another person's emotions to understand them, which allows you to connect and have an attachment toward that, towards that person. So these are all these two things that I just mentioned, the mental process, the belief, the characteristics, and then the unhealthy relationships are all based on the successful outcomes of what Erickson has described as the psychosocial. So lastly, the unhealthy relationships are permissiveness, um, not really feeling strong or being kind of passive or dismissive, lack of support, not a, being um, attuned to a person's need, rejecting someone, probably without explaining their the feeling that you have or why you don't want to be friends or even knowing how you actually feel, being insensitive towards their needs, having a sense of hostility or anger towards them, or just kind of a lack of emotions, like indifference about how you feel in that relationship or towards that person. And then the healthy 
social development overall leads to an identity that is distinct, productive within a larger social framework. So not just within yourself, like I can have my identity with myself, but how does that identity rate relate to other people and friends and like a social dynamic? It doesn't have to be a big group of friends, but just like work. Um, well, adult speaking, um, um, kids in school and kids in extracurricular activities and being a daughter, um, how does that relate into those social frameworks and dynamics? Competence, um, which is allowing an individual to feel effective as they're interacting with their surroundings. So understanding their surroundings, understand what's going on, having curiosity and awareness, and then adding that social component. So that's understanding and being aware of managing frustrating challenges or experiences with others. And this is from a child, um, child perspective. Okay, so that was what I tried to condense as quickly as possible about social, pretty much psychosocial development, social development areas. Um, they are intertwined. So physical, social, cognitive, um, and emotional are all combined. Um, and these two often overlap too. So even though that was like psychosocial theory, um, there's so many areas in there that focus on emotional. Uh, so it's a key point to recognize they they just are so intertwined that when you work on one, you're working on the other all the time. But um, trying to differentiate for you guys between like the theories when you focus on one, this is what happens when you focus on the other, and let's combine the two. So attachment, which I did mention, you know, briefly in the psychosocial um, area of development um, about the secure and insecure attachment, and that was in the birth to one for the Eric's Erickson. And then you have um, the overall attachment theory that came from John Bowlby and Mary Answorth, which if you hear about any attachment style, these are the people that created it and this is where it came from. It's been added on to, but um, this, is, this is the main, main um, points here. So the development of attachment, <coughs> excuse me, um, there's the pre-attachment, so birth to three months. Infant has really no particular attachment to the caregiver. They have a sense of like the mom that was carrying the baby. So when you're separating that, excuse me, when you're separating that kiddo, um, if you adopt, that's considered like a birth trauma because that, that kid is aware, even though they can still develop a healthy attachment to an adoptive parent. <coughs> or if a parent passes away and the other parent is still there, it's still doable, but there is like that trauma because of the separation. So while there is no particular attachment for a specific caregiver at that point, the infant still recognizes the separation. Um, from birth to four months, uh, they just enjoy being held and even just being around somebody. And then there's the, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. <coughs> there's the indiscriminate attachment, which starts to formulate from six weeks to seven months. So they're not really aware of like, I have this secure attachment with this person, but I'm aware of like, I'm developing, like it's starting to happen. They have stronger attachments to their main caregivers, but not a discriminant one yet. Then they hit that point of discriminant attachment at eight months. And that infant starts to show a strong attachment to one specific caregiver. Um, and that may be the mother, but it's like kind of in between, like if there are two parents, um, whoever they are, two caregivers, um, they start to have that stronger attachment toward those caregivers, even though it may shift to one a little bit more than the other. And then there's the multiple attachments at 10 months. And that's when they create multiple bonds with multiple caregivers. And what an experiment that was shown about, hey, like we were thinking that kiddos or little infants only like to be attached because that the caregiver provides them food, but this experiment was like, actually, that's not true. Um, the infant enjoys the con the contact from the caregiver and the comfort more than they do just like the food. So that's really important to recognize. It's like that physiological touch and the comfort and the caring and the connection and the attunement. All of those things matter more than just feeding the child for like survival purposes. <clears throat> and then you have the two attachments that were um 
came from uh, the main experiment, which was a secure attachment. So attachment in general is an emotional bond between an infant and a caregiver. And then secure is like when a caregiver is warm and they're responsive and they're sensitive to their infant's needs, um, they're available. So the main point is like secure means the, the, the caregiver or parent is available. They meet the child's needs um, and they're able to be attuned with the child, be aware um, and that allows the child to know like, oh, the world is safe. My needs will be met. I'm able to explore the world. So that goes back to what I was talking about with like um, the mistrust versus trust area. So then you have insecure, which is um, when the caregiver can be neglectful and inconsistent and sensitive to the infant's needs. And because of that, they learn, oh, Nobody's gonna, I'm, I can't depend upon somebody. They're not gonna meet my needs and this world is really unsafe. So from that came four different attachment styles from Mary Answorth. And um, there's ambivalent, which is super uncommon. Um, it's usually just a, a infant is feeling distressed when a parent leaves and a child learns, of course, they cannot depend on that caregiver. There's avoidant when the parent or caregiver doesn't really show up um, a preference towards like, a or the infant doesn't show a preference towards a stranger or caregiver, like I don't know who's safe or who's better or who's not. Um, and this may be because of like ne neglect and abuse. Um, so, or if a child is constantly being punished, um, so they feel like they can't seek help when their needs aren't being met. Uh, then you have disorganized, which is the parent is kind of displaying really confusing behaviors. And then the infant starts to feel confused because of, there's such an inconsistency in the caregiver. Um, and the parent can become a source of comfort, but also a source of fear. So the child is confused. So disorganized kind of feels like, oh, this, I'm not really sure what to believe. And then as we talked about in the previous slide, there's secure attachment, which is like a really high percentage. I think it's about 60% of most uh, infants or individuals that end up having a secure attachment. So the impact of attachment indicates that children that fail to form like the secure attachments can also have a negative impact on their behavior later on in life or throughout life. And keep in mind what I mentioned at the beginning. This, this can be true, but this can be, uh, they didn't can they didn't report like, well, people work on that and then they can form a secure attachment, which is also true. Um, and children with a diagnosis of um, ODD means oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder or PTSD are more likely to display like attachment problems due to the neglect, abuse or trauma. And children that are adopted after the age of six months have higher issue with attachment based on what I told you in the beginning about like pulling a child away from that caregiver immediately or even before that they have developed that sense of like, this is the one person I depend on, which happens at eight months. So six months would be fall into that range of I'm not there yet and then I'm being traumatized by pulling that apart. So with securely attached um, toddlers and preschoolers and I gave this information because like that's kind of where the foundation starts to build and just continuously builds off of that so I didn't put middle school or high school or elementary because that they don't focus on that and there's not a lot of research in those areas they really focus on the little ones and how you build and build on top of that so they have indicated better problem solvers more creative um, they attract um, playmates like friends sensitive towards others, they're more curious, they're self-directed, and they're eager to learn. <clears throat> so that also coincides completely with that psychosocial area. So we're in emotional now, but that coincides with um, what Erickson said about the areas of industry, feeling confident, having that sense of self, um, and also feeling confident to explore the world. So now you're like, okay, well, you gave me this information, so let's look at, like, by age. So I kept it between five, and I think I did 
10 um, just to make sure I stay within time limit. But for age five, some things, these are things that you can expect. These are things that are normal. Um, socially, a kiddo at five is going to be eager to do activities, eager to please others. They're going to be little tattle tailors because they're learning um, morals and right from wrong. And that's a whole nother section about moral development that you can go into um, and what that looks like. And there's three different stages of that. Uh, so with five, they can also be oppositional when playing with others. They may see overly demanding or disobedient because they're trying to gain their autonomy and sense of self. They like to help. They like to follow the rules and be good because they're in that moral area of like good girl, bad, bad girl or good boy, bad girl. Um, and they kind of are conditioned to operate off, off of that thought of like being good is a good thing and people will like me. Um, then you have is polite, friendly towards new people, and then emotionally intense mood fluctuations because they're learning more about their moods. They're probably having conflicts with their peers. They're getting rejected. So like they're that all of that's happening in that um, social part too. And then their emotionals or emotions are responding to that. Um, they're a little bit more anxious. So bite their nails or pull their hair or cry to relieve their anxiety. They can be indecisive hesitant and insecure. Um, they're learning better how to understand people with empathy and respond to them. They become confident in their abilities and this can be related towards school or academic, I mean school or extracurricular activities. They learn to um, demonstrate more self-control, less impulsiveness. Um, they try not to be overstimulated. They're aware of how that may make their body feel. And they're able to express feelings more verbally than just having temper tantrums um, or not saying anything at all. But most of the time, what you're get, you'll get from this age prior is like those temper tantrums. Um, at the age of six, they want to be the best. They feel confident in who they are and wanting to do well. They want to be first at everything. They may lie to avoid punishment because they don't like the idea of being seen good or um, like bad, um, especially in front of peers. They value their friends. They get to choose the people that are similar to them so they're able to relate to people. They create new rules to cheat <laughs> at games, um, to win at games because they're learning more about like what's gonna, um, how to manipulate things and manipulate rules um, to bend things towards things that will benefit them. Uh, they might wrestle or chase or scream or fight. Uh, they're much more affectionate with their friends. They're eager to please others. And they may be a little bit competitive with their siblings. Then emotionally for a six-year-old, they're more sensitive to criticism because they're gaining a stronger sense of self and correction. So it's like you're taking a jab at like, I feel good about myself. And then you're trying to, feels like you're tearing that down. Um, more emotionally vital under stress or when hungry, um, more gaining more sense of competence and mastery in various areas. Um, more aware of others' needs and feelings and starting to feel even more proud of their accomplishments. And then we have the seven and eight-year-olds. So enjoys playing with friends, is more cooperative, uh, frequently compares himself to peers because social development starts to become really important, starts to become important. It's not as important as when they get to their um, later adolescence, but it's like starting here. Believes everyone is out to get them and believes the world is unfair because they're learning that they can't control things and things are not going their way. So it's like, oh, I started to manipulate, you know, back at five and six and that started to work and then it stops working here as much and that doesn't feel fair. Um, concerned about acceptance of others, their fight for their seat in the line or car. Emotionally, they're more withdrawn and quieter and um, thinking that this is like I'm starting to gain more autonomy or a sense of inner self. Experiencing large shifts in moods may seem moody or sad for no complete reason. Tend to worry about serious things. Um, one of these that this is probably mentioning is at this age, they become aware of like death is permanent and like people can get hurt and like more severe things are just not ideas. Like they're real things that happen in life. Uh, they may blame others for wrongdoings and have difficulty admitting to failure and they may cry easily. Um, don't like to be embarrassed in front of their peers. 
And for an eight-year-old, they like to talk more. They feel more confident about sharing stories. They prefer groups over solitary play. Um, they spend time with their friends. They enjoy like team activities that are extracurricular. Um, they're easily influenced by peers. They're learning to accept what peers have to say, probably more so over parents. They like to play with same-sex peers. Um, so they may shift from playing with boys and girls, and then they're like, well, I just want to play with someone the same sex as me, um, feeling more comfortable in that area. They'll use technology to connect with peers, and they're still sensitive, they're still sensitive to criticism and correction, and emotionally still <laughs> sensitive. So they're sensitive for social, like in social settings, and just in, in individually, emotionally to criticism. They're more emotionally volatile under stress when hungry. Similar thing as um, age seven, more aware of others' needs and feelings and proud of their accomplishments. So I would say the biggest change for the seven and eight emotionally is just a greater sense of competency and uh, more aware of others' needs and feelings. And then for age nine, they start to feel seem a little detached. So this is like those preteens we're getting into. Um, interested of knowledge of sex because they're starting to probably develop puberty wise. So and they are noticing other peers developing too and there's curiosity that starts to happen. So they're interested in knowledge of sex, displays little interest in opposite sex. They're concerned with peer acceptance. They're competitive with their peers. They may be overcritical of their self and overcritical of others. So they're starting to learn to judge people um, by either their standards or society standards, whatever they've started to learn about roles, like we were talking before, like roles and identities. Um, tends to worry or become anxious, gets feeling hurt easily. They're more determined though. So they're still gonna have responsibility, like motivation. They're more mature, calmer with their emotions. Um, they feel a little bit more confident and dependable. Um, in this area, they can start to lean towards perfectionism to try to grasp concepts and do things the right way still. And then for those 10 year olds, they're more cooperative. Um, they're more accepting of rules and morals and what's supposed to be and what's not. Um, they understand, accept those social rules and under in those interactions doesn't mean that they'll fight against them sometimes, but they're learning more to understand them. They'll seek out friends and like emotional support from those friends instead of always being dependent on parents or caregivers. They're concerned with belonging to a friend group that becomes really important to have like this, these people that I have a, a relationship with and I belong somewhere and I fit somewhere. They start to spend, um, experience the sense of racial identity. They start to learn this like way back when they're like four or five or thing, I think. I'm not exactly sure the right age, but they are aware of it. But then they start to develop and experience like racial identity and what that means to them. Um, they commonly have peers of the same racial, racial, ethnic, or cultural, like their shared similarities, shared experience. So they start to seek out people similar to them. And because they're doing that, they're noticing things about their self and things about other people. They become more aware of same-sex attractions. Um, and then emotionally, they're relatively more calm than being overly anxious or moody, like we were talking about the previously age, ages because they're more um, knowledgeable of how they feel and how to respond to that and responding to negative feelings. They seem to be more flexible emotionally and cognitively. They're comfortable in their environment. They still are in this moral development phase of I need to be perceived as good. They start to just demonstrate a sense of self-confidence. They're using cognitive skills to regulate emotions, so logic. Like, oh, because this happened, yes, I'm sad, but here's an alternative. So they're starting to use their cognition and just not self-regulatory skills, um, like physiological skills um, or comfort from another person. They're starting to self-regulate with their cognitive abilities. Um, they can become angry quickly, but regulate. 
pretty quickly. They prefer routine and organization, and they're growing the sense of independence and independence in decision making. So they're starting to build on to what it is starting to feel like to feel independent and then my autonomy and um, how that matters to me and I want it to matter to other people. So I, kind of, I stopped at 10 just because I know that I would be getting close to time, um, but there's more information for, you know, goes all the way up to 18, I think for most development. Um, I think there's some development in regards to that that may go to 20s, but mostly they'll try to stop at that 18 year old mark. Um, just based on when we're talking about developmental milestones, you're usually ch referring to children. Um, but yes, you do go up to 18. The list just gets a lot shorter. So I mentioned self-regulation a few times, so I just wanted to um, list a few characteristics of that. So self-regulation allows you to cooperate, um, focus on attention, manage transitions, follow routines, manage strong emotions, share things in space, wait and take your turn, communicate your emotions and understand emotions. So when you hear that term, um, you can imagine all of these things falling underneath that term. So some tips just when you're thinking about, it doesn't really matter what age you have of a kiddo, um, be a model, use emotional language, lots of lots of language. Um, lots of feeling words, not to be overly emotional, but the more language that you're using, the more that they're learn, learning and they'll be able to describe their situation with, the, with the, the appropriate word versus I use frustration or anger for everything where I actually feel sad or devastated or disappointed. We don't always just feel frustrated. A lot of times there's something deeper than that. So helping them with developing the language is really important. It's great to storytell. So you sharing your own experiences with your work day or family situations or um, marital experiences that are developmentally appropriate. <laughs> sharing too much is not always healthy for your kiddo, but what's developmentally appropriate for them. Um, you're teaching them how to problem solve. You're teaching that it's okay to have emotions. You're teaching how to understand somebody else's feelings. You're teaching empathy. You're teaching um, attunement. You're teaching perspective taking. So being a model is huge. Um, lastly for that, display healthy relationships and friendships. So whether that's in the home with the family dynamic or with your individual friends that you might have. So a lot of times um, when I work with clients, some parents don't really have good examples of friends and the kids don't really know how to learn because if they're delayed in that social area, um, they're looking to somebody and it's great to have a parent that does have a situation that they can display something healthy and they can teach their child about that. Encourage, always encourage your child. If they're struggling, if they're doing well, it doesn't matter. Encourage them to work on something. Encourage them to keep thriving. Encourage them in their strength. Encourage them in their weakness, but encourage them. Um, play or engage with them. Play for my, for my littles, you know, even, hey, up until preteens, you guys can still play board games or do crafts or, arts or play basketball or play soccer. Um, and if they're not really into activities, then engage. So that could be talking with them, sitting with them, just being, building on communication with them. Ask them questions, try to understand more about their thought processes, their experiences. Um, be responsive to their emotions. Don't just say, oh, everything's gonna be okay or sorry you feel that way or you know validate respond to their feeling especially if it's appropriate like it's a anger is an appropriate feeling frustration is appropriate um enraged is appropriate it's really all about what you do with that feeling so let's not dismiss the feelings if they're not happy and wonderful and joyful and hopeful all the time um we that suppresses the true experience it's being responsive and validating and teaching what we do with that feeling so that not only can they learn it, but they can emulate that in social settings. Um, ask open-ended questions. So not yes or no things. Kids love to just be like, yeah, or no, or I don't know. Um, they love, I don't know. I just, I'm not sure. 
um, just like those um, habitual answers where they're not really thinking because that they can either say, yeah, <laughs> easily or sure, okay. But if you ask something that requires them to process, that is engaging more. So open-ended questions are super helpful and be present. Being present doesn't mean being on a phone or always watching movies. It's <clears throat> engaging in non-technological activities sometimes. Um, just being with them. Sometimes it doesn't include talking. Sometimes you could just be sitting with your kid. You being there, that nonverbal connection is so valuable. So these are just a few tips based on social um, um, emotional development. And like I said, it's not just critical periods and then we're finished. This continues to grow and develop over time. So thank you guys for listening to my presentation. I'm right in enough time to answer any questions that you guys may have. So while I'm still recording, um, I do just want to thank you very much for <coughs> that presentation. And do you want to, um, yeah, there you go. I was going to say we were getting a weird mirror effect of seeing our own faces on your screen. Um, but I am just want to say thank you so much for presenting and I am going to stop recording. So if anybody wants to ask questions, they feel comfortable doing so. So I'm going to stop recording right now.